The rubber economy beyond the coronavirus crisis. What will be the prospects and measures to be taken by the rubber industry? Coming up live shortly. Today's forum is sponsored by the Roos Plans. The Roos Plans is a Belgian company specializes in tissue culture technology. Next tour on mental crops. For more information, do visit www.derousrubber.com or www.derousplants.com. Hi, welcome to Convex Up channel. I'm Bonnie Rajzan, your host for Expert Insight at Live, a broadcast series featuring forums and interviews with industry thought leaders on market, policy, strategy, technology, and innovation that steer the industry growth. Splendid. To all our viewers out there from all over the world, if you have any inquiries or questions later, kindly share them on Slido, hashtag Rubber Expert Insight Live, or tweet us at GRC Secretariat. Many lives and businesses had been impacted by the recent outbreak of coronavirus, which had brought major economic disruption globally. The rubber industry in particular has not been spared either. The industry is keen to find out what the rubber economy will look like beyond the coronavirus crisis. Is there prospects or mitigation measures to be taken by the industry? I have with me today some of the most remarkable experts. First, we have Dr. John Beveris, the senior agricultural economist from the World Bank. Next, we have Mr. Joan Jacob. He is the Senior Economist of the Association of Natural Rubber Producing Countries, or NRPC. Mr. Darwong, an experienced commodity analyst and fund manager from ALA Advisors Singapore. And last but not the very least, an agricultural veteran with over 40 years of experience, Dr. Dr. Professor Ahmad Ibrahim, Head of Research at Convex Up and Professor at the UCSI University to lead the discussion and share with us their thoughts and insight. First of all, how are you, Da? How have you been doing lately? I'm good. I'm good, Bunny. Thank you. Yeah, and hi to all the guys. Thank you for coming to the forum. And uh, today is a happy day for all. Mm. Fantastic indeed. Joan, what's up hey. with you? Hey. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to the show. Uh, everything is fine on my side. Mm -hmm. Glad to hear that, Doctor. John, how are you? Yeah, good afternoon from my side. Uh, doing well, and thank you for this opportunity. Fabulous, indeed. Viewers, without further ado, I will now hand over this segment to none other than Dr. Dr. Professor Ahmad Ibrahim. Thank you very much, Bunny, for that very nice introduction of the topic. And welcome again, our panelists. Uh, in fact, we have very uh, eminent personalities today who will speak on this very issue of the rubber industry, prospects, and the future after this uh, pandemic that has affected us all. And uh, I also would like to welcome uh, viewers throughout the world, in fact, I'm told that there are viewers from Nigeria, Brazil, Europe, and all the rubber producing countries. 
this is very encouraging because rubber is still a very major commodity for the world and many industries cannot actually survive without rubber natural rubber so to start off the discussion i'll first invite our panelist from the us dr john buffers to speak on the the commodity situation please john uh, thank you uh, again good afternoon everybody and uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to be part of the show uh, i would like to share with you uh, a couple of a few ideas uh, or our thinking rather uh, about the global economy as well as the commodity markets uh, can i have the next slide please uh, thank you. Uh, this slide pretty much summarizes what is the state uh, of the global economy, what is the state of the global commodities markets now versus to what they were not that long ago, back in, uh, in January 2020, just five months, short five months ago. Uh, let me begin with, uh, with uh, uh, our assessment about global growth. Uh, which in fact come from a report that the World Bank released just uh, about uh, a little over than a week ago. Uh, and as we can see, uh, back in January, our expectation was that uh, for this year, that is 2020, global growth was uh, expected to average about 2.5%. Uh, Five months later, uh, our uh, Assessment about global growth has been, of course, revised downward very, very sharply. And uh, now we expect that the global economy will contract uh, at a rate of about 5.2%. Uh, uh, this, uh, of course, is due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is the, uh, the worst kind of uh, recession that we expect to have uh, during our uh, during the Great Depression of 1929. Uh, of course, along with global growth, we expect per capita incomes is in most uh, emerging markets and developing economies to, uh, to shrink uh, considerably this year. And uh, again, let me emphasize the fact that uh, this minus 0.52 contraction in the global economy, that's our base case scenario. So things can get worse uh, if, for example, uh, the pandemic is not brought uh, other control or it takes longer than expected or the financial stress let's say triggers uh, cascading defaults throughout uh, uh, major industries around the world now moving to commodity markets uh, the energy markets especially the oil market has taken probably the hardest hit across all commodity markets uh, again uh, late last year, we expected or rather forecasted that uh, crude oil will average $58 per barrel this year. Our April 23 assessment is that uh, the average this year will be $35. Uh, uh, demand, of course, is the major factor that uh, demand for oil, that is, is a major factor that has affected a lot uh, the, the oil markets. And that's again another shocking development that has taken place uh, in the energy markets uh, the expectation was that this year uh, global oil consumption will exceed 100 barrels uh, per year in fact uh, the expectation was that will average one or 1 1.5 barrels per year a uh, million barrels per year rather uh, the latest assessment by the International Energy Association, which agency, which just in fact uh, came out uh, today, is that uh, global demand for oil will contract by almost 10%, 9.7% to be exact. Uh, similar developments, but less severe, has taken place have taken place in other commodity markets uh, in terms of metals prices. We expect an almost 13 uh, percent decline in prices versus uh, what we envisaged prior to COVID-19, and of course uh, that has to do uh, with base metals. When we go to, to, to precious metals, especially gold price, the situation is uh, completely the reverse because of the uncertainty, the COVID-19 uncertainty, etc. The expectations about the gold price has been revised up. And that's uh, about 9% uh, higher than what uh, we expected prior to COVID-19. 
Uh, we have major developments as expected on the macro side, uh, on the on the monetary side, we have the US dollar, which has uh, gained a lot of strength. Uh, yeah. And between uh, January and uh, May, it has appreciated about uh, six, more than 6.5%. And of course, that has a major, uh, has impact, impacted commodities in a major way, because as we all know, uh, the dollar moves in opposite directions with uh, respect to commodity prices. When the dollar is strong, commodity prices are weak and the other way around. So that's also one other reason as to why commodity prices have uh, uh, have taken a kind of a strong hit. And the last key, lastly, we have interest rates, which uh, pretty much across the world have come down. And uh, a lot of central banks have brought their interest rates down to near zero levels. In the United States, for example, the 10-year U.S. Treasury bill is down from an average of 1.7 or 1.8 percent back in uh, in January to 0.7 percent, the most recent figure that we have uh, from uh, 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 from the. The United States. So again, this is a characteristic that uh, across the board, all uh, uh, central banks have engaged in a very low interest rate environment and various purchases of assets. So in order to inject a lot of liquidity in the uh, in the economy. So let me stop here in terms of the global markets. I'll be happy to elaborate more uh, if you or the audience has any questions. Yeah, thank you very much, John. That was a very good uh, overview of the situation with regards to commodities. Mm -hmm. It looks like everything is down except gold. Exactly, precisely. Right. Everything is right. down right. except precious metals. Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, okay, next, why don't we move to our speaker from Singapore, who is also looking at the market and uh, the financial and the commodities. Uh, please welcome Mr. Dar Wong. Yes, Dar. Uh, I'll just quickly uh, taking the next five minutes. Can the technical team put up my slides? I have only two slides to talk about. Can we put up the slides? Okay, the first slide, I'm going to talk about a brief uh, overview macro fundamentals of the world. And the second slide is a forecast on the rubber pricing. I will wait for the first slides to come up first. All right, thank you. Okay, do not click until I say click. All right, so, um, okay, the first part of this uh, macro fundamentals, um, first of all, we are taking an overview on the pandemic crisis. Okay, as what Dr. John mentioned earlier, this is the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression in the last century, 1929. And um, just briefly to give you guys how bad it has affected the global world, all right, just based on the Q1 seasons of this year, all right, Q1 seasons, um, U.S. GDP has shrank 5%, all right? And China GDP has shrank 6.8%, and that is about the lowest in the last 20 years, if I can remember correctly. And Eurozone that, com that comprises 19 countries uh, shrank a record 3.8%. So the whole pandemic crisis is not just affecting one or two countries or one region, but we are talking about the whole world, all right? And um, secondly, we are talking about what is going to... Uh, be another shakeup to the world, I would think that will be this coming November on the US presidential election. Okay, uh, why I mentioned that? Because we all know that uh, President Trump um, always favors about low interest rate or even going to negative interest rates. So if Trump is going to continue on the second term, all right, we foresee that the dollar may continue to devalue and that will also give um, a great influence on the commodities. We'll talk about that later. Then the thirdly, um, Fed funds rates has been very low, all right, in the range of zero uh, percent to point quarter percent. Why I mentioned about this first part is because these three important factors are directly affecting on the U.S. dollar value, which inversely will be um, also putting a great impact or influence on the commodity prices, which and that will include on rubber. All right, please click. Click, please. Then the, from US, we are taking a look. Uh, technical team, can you please click on the slide? Yes. All right. So 
After US, let's take a look on the European side. Uh, European debt has been enlarging and that is uh, also not on a very positive side that I foresee because uh, the European sovereign fund, most probably in the next one or two years, will be enlarging and ballooning. And that will actually create a very negative effect on the back end. And European Central Bank has actually uh, declared that they are going to launch a new stimulus of 750 billion euros. And that is a big sum of money. And on UK itself, all right, UK itself, such a big nation, just in the month of April, they have actually saw a slight of 20.4% in the GDP. So what we are going to talk about now is that on US and Europe, we all know that the biggest impact uh, of the pandemic crisis is actually on the Q2. And we are still now in the, at the end of Q2, June. So most likely what we're going to see on the greater impact that will come will probably in the Q3 when all the Q2 figures will be released. That will be sometime in mid-July, all right? And uh, the demand, uh, high shrinkage in the Q3 definitely will affect on rubber prices and the general commodities. Okay, please click again. Okay, on the third part, let's come back to Asia, which uh, the largest economic powerhouse is China, definitely, all right? As I mentioned earlier, China has... Uh, uh, shrank 6.8% in the first quarter of uh, 2020, and that is really quite bad. All right, so let's do a quick summary. World Bank, uh, I think Dr. John Bears knows better than me. World Bank has actually predict, predicted that the global economy in year 2020 will shrink 5.2%. And honestly, I think that is quite friendly. Perhaps on the second half of the year, there'll be another revision coming. All right, other than World Bank, IMF also predicts that the whole um, year of 2020, the global economy was shrink 3.3%. And I also think that is very friendly because they do not want to frighten the world. But most likely, I'm, I personally, we foresee that moving into the second half year, there could be a prediction and uh, it will not be surprised to see the global economy this year will shrink anywhere from minus 5 to minus 7%. Of course, I put a disclaimer that's on, on our own research and studies. All right. So let's click again, the technical team. Let's go to the last part of this slide. All right, after we have talked about uh, US, Europe, and China, which are the three major economy in the world. So, rubble, how would they fare in their performance this year? Personally, I would think that rubber prices um, have detached from um, a lot of uh, mineral prices or even uh, gold prices that they used to attach together in the past five years. In fact, rubber prices are very much... Um, a, dare, a daring back to crude oil trend. So if crude oil prices are going down, there are very high chances that rubber prices will also want in the demand for this year alone. And in fact, we are looking at crude prices not on a very positive side because uh, one reason is uh, coronavirus. The other thing is the major transport in all the uh, sea freight, air, and on land are slowing down because of the global recession. So the demand of crude oil prices will be reducing. Then at the same time, the global supply glut will continue to increase despite the OPEC plus countries keep talking about uh, a, a cut in a global production. But in any way, we are foreseeing that crude oil prices uh, will be on the downside. Okay, Most likely for the rest of the year, we are looking at crude oil prices to be anywhere averaging at 20 US dollars per barrel. I'm talking about WTI crude, uh, WTI crude, the US crude, averaging at 20 US dollars or perhaps even a bit lower than that. So um, on the general, we are talking about crude oil prices on the low side. So rubble prices most likely, okay, most likely, but let's not be pessimistic. Most likely rubber prices will remain uh, on the downside for the rest of the year until the end of year 2020. Okay, let's click and move to the next slide, which is my final slide. I'm going to spend another two minutes just to talk about the rubber prices forecast for year 2020. Okay, the chart that you're looking here, this chart is based on SICOM chart, which is Singapore Exchange, all right? The rubber pricing, which is based on the weak chart. What is a weak chart? That means uh, every one bar of movement, although I squeeze them together, the prices are based on weekly performance starting from 2011 all the way until now, okay? This chart was extracted based on last night, the, the latest closing, okay? Okay, as we could see on the chart itself, you, you we could see that rubber prices has been coming down for the last almost 10 years, all right? I have put a few illustrations there. In March 2012, we have the price of $3.88 per kg. This is the price based on, based on per kg, all right? Then after that, uh, in uh, 
February 21, 6, it came already came down to $1.03. Then there was a bounce up in 2017, February back to $2.45, which I remember I, pred I predicted these prices correctly at that time in Cambodia. Then after that, the prices started to sink again. Until January 2020 this year, that was about five months ago, it was still trading at 1.53. Then now it's coming down back below $1.20 per kg. All right. So let's take a look at the uh, the uh, market commentary that I wrote at the bottom. All right. I only wrote four sentences before I close this uh, presentation. Trend is prone to weakness, okay, in general sentiment among rubber prices this year. Then the worst performance in... Uh, in uh, 2020, sorry, in 2020, I wrote wrongly as 2002. It should be worst performance in 2020. It could just go back down to $1 per kg, and that's the worst. I don't think it will go anything worse than that. And in fact, I think uh, we have gone through this $1 benchmark at the bottom in the year 2001 during the 911 crisis. Another second time was 2008 during the financial crisis. So I won't be surprised if this year on the second half year, rubber prices will go back down to $1 before it bounces up. But anyway, on the top side for this year alone, for the next six months, I am looking at a very strong resistance at $1.20 per kg, which on the chart itself, you can uh, clearly see the resistance, the resistance line that I have drawn. Okay, $1.20, whenever market touch here, it will probably turn down again, which it did, I think, last week. So um, overall trend below EMA 200, which stands for Exponential Moving Average, 200 average line, Okay, indicates a general bearish sentiment in the market. And last but not least, any time in the future, which I foresee it will only come in the year 2021, second half year, which is going to be another one year from now. Only when we start to see Sycom rubber prices can protrude up above $1.40 per kg. All right, $1.40. Then we would dare to make a very bold forecast that there could be a genuine recovery prices in rubber. $1.40, which we are not even near to there now. We are actually now trading below $120, all right? So uh, let me just uh, repeat again. So in order for the recovery of rubber prices to come in, we have to see the price that protrude above $1.40 per kg. And in our own target, okay, the timeline, we believe it should be in the second half year of next year, 2021. It will not be this year. So generally this year, we are talking about a low demand. Rubber prices probably will be doing sideways. Okay, worse come to worse, it may go back down to just one dollar in the second half of this year, but before it bounced back. So overall range is between a dollar to a dollar twenty cents US dollars per kg. All right, I will end my presentation. I'll pass the mic back to uh, Prof Ahmad. Thank you very much for all the people that listen. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Darwan. As always, thank you. very mm. uh, precise look at the market and the future. Anyway, mm. uh, we have seen. In both the presentation, the impact that this COVID or the pandemic has had on the rubber industry doesn't look very exciting. So the next speaker, Mr. John Jacob, he's from the Association of Nature Rubber Producing Countries. Let's hear what he has to say about how the rubber industry is responding to these difficulties. Please, Mr. John Jacob. Uh -huh. Thank you, Dr. Ahmad. And also, uh, we thank, also on behalf of the Association of Natural Rubber Producing Countries, we thank Conference for this opportunity. And also, the, we appreciate the initiative, good new initiative by the expert insight at LAI by the Conference Hub. Uh, let me have a quick look into, uh, let, let us have a quick look into the impacts on the world consumption of natural rubber. World consumption of natural rubber is expected to be down 6%. Uh, in 2020. In fact, at the beginning of this year, NRPC expected the world consumption to be positive 1.2%. And now it is expected, 2020 figure is expected down minus 6.0%. That means the new figure is nearly 1 million tons lower than the figure anticipated earlier. Uh, next slide, production coming to the next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, and coming to the because of the low demand for natural rubber, uh, the price came down, not only because of the lower demand for natural rubber, the price was affected also by the, what is called a negative market sentiments caused by the global economic fallout and uh, demand outlook for natural rubber. Apart from that, there was 
uh, the collapse of global stocks, collapse of crude oil prices, and commodities in general. So speaking broadly, uh, both uh, the futures markets as well as the physical markets uh, came down by around 25% uh, between mid-January until mid-June. Mid-January until mid-June, around 25% fall. Physical mar mar market, I refer to the SMR20 price at Kuala Lumpur, and uh, TSR, technically specified rubber, is considered as a benchmark in the global uh, uh, global market because around 70% of the global trade is uh, trade is for the for the TSR and for the inner latex in fact latex benefited from the spike in the demand for gloves uh, created by the COVID pandemic and uh, there was uh, RSS ribbed smoke sheet benefited because uh, farmers and the farmer cooperatives shifted to latex uh, instead of selling in the form of RSS and we have a quick look into the response of the farmers next slide please next slide Next slide, please. Yeah, farmers response, when the price came down, uh, farmers responded to that by reducing the harvesting or totally abstaining from the harvesting. And the world production of natural rubber is expected to be down 4.7%, down 4.7%, minus 4.7% for the previous year. In fact, at the beginning of the year, the expected expectation on the world production was positive plus 2.7 percent higher than the previous year and now it is expected 4.7 percent minus from the previous year and the difference is uh, 1.044 million tons that means a uh, production uh, because of the covid the production uh, anticipated production for 2020 be uh, lower by more than 1 million tons than what was expected earlier. Going to the next slide, that is the uh, nature of the crisis in different segments of the industry. Actually, when we go into the uh, into the uh, different segments of the industry, uh, the crisis was affected, crisis affected different segments of industry almost in a similar way, but a little bit different also. I'm going not going into the details. We have the auto tire manufacturing sector, which is affected by the, what is called a huge drop in the original equipment demand, that is a demand for uh, tire from the, for the new vehicles, and also the retail demand, that is also called a replacement demand for tire. And uh, that is mainly affected by that one, and also affected by the pessimistic outlook on the auto sector, as well as economy. And the general rubber goods sector, or non-tire sector, also affected, uh, first of all, by the huge uh, demand drop, and gloves and the healthcare product was the only sector which was uh, an exception. All other sectors were affected. And uh, around 30% of the micro, small, and medium enterprises are at the level of, uh, maybe at the stage of closing their business because of the, uh, because they are severely affected by the cash uh, uh, credit crunch. And this is the situation. And the same is situation in the case of process and processes and, and the traders of TSR, which is constituting around 70% of the volume trade. And some of the factories have already closed the operation, closed the operation, and some are in the process of closing the operation because of the uh, severe financial problem and uh, liquidity crunch. And next slide, please. And going into the into the case of farmers, we can see uh, the farmers also affected because price severely affected because price went down by 25% between mid January and now. 25% um, price came down, and the for most farmers were unable to sell the produce kapilam because the TSR factories stopped the production, stopped the purchase of kapilam for the farmers because TSR had no demand, so they had to reduce the operation. So they either reduced the purchase or stopped the purchase. That means the farmers also were in trouble. Go into the next slide. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. And what are the short-term policy prescriptions? In fact, actually, coming into the short-term policy prescriptions, uh, in fact, actually, uh, the COVID-19 basically impacted the energy sector through the demand side, through the demand side. So anything to address the issue, we have to start with the demand side. So that means the corrective policy should focus on bringing the demands 
back to track. That should be the policy approach. So we have a number of policy issues. We are proposing a number of policy issues which is, uh, which could help original equipment demand or vehicle uh, the tire demand for the worker sector to go up and the replacement demand to go up. And some of the uh, measures, which, uh, if there is a pol stimulus policy measures that can uh, help the economy that will be uh, having a positive impact on the demand for natural rubber because demand for natural rubber is closely related to the economy. And uh, a number of policies have been uh, suggested here, which could how which could help the the uh, healthy sector uh, to come back from the crisis. Next slide, please. Then going beyond the crisis, so so we have the we have the beyond the crisis means uh, beyond the short term basis. We have uh, we have seen we have seen that the short term uh, approach should focus on helping the industry to rise from the fall, but beyond that. There should be policies. Uh, 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 policy. There should be policies that could uh, help the industry to be successful. Uh, when the business world is actually uh, reshaping itself, so if strongly supported by the respective governments, uh, the COVID-19 is an opportunity to modernize the various segments of the rubber industry to make them fit for the for, for the future. And, uh, and in this process of modernization. Uh, trust may be given on the what's the transition for the transition towards greener economy. So that should be the crucial part of this one. Next slide, please. So now we have uh, we have actually uh, we have been talking about the new normal for quite for some time, even before the pandemic came. New normal. In fact, the COVID epidemic make all those new processes much faster than expected. So that means a new normal is emerging earlier than expected because of the COVID. This is a one positive impact, positive or negative, we have to discuss impacts of the COVID-19. So what are the various dimensions of various elements of this new normal? One is a re-emergence of protectionism. Protectionism, protectionism I think that means a reverse globalization, going back from the globalization. It has positive as well as negative implication. So that made the vary from country to country, vary from sector to sector. And also global trend towards localization. That is a preference to source raw material for locally and a preference to uh, access local market rather than accessing faraway markets. And another one, the state is back. That means a COVID proved that the states, the active intervention of the state is very important, especially when we, we have seen that in the, in the case of COVID management, state was playing a key role. So earlier we were talking about state is having reduced importance, lower importance, and everything is to be done by the private sector. But now we have seen state coming to the central stage and the less dependence on the public transportation or preference to personalize the mobility. That could be another change we are seeing. Another change is artificial intelligence replacing human jobs. Another positive change, and this can be expected very soon in the automobile industry, uh, because wherever whichever industry which is depending more, which is having more repeated jobs, uh, artificial intelligence in the form of robotics or robotics will be having a major role to play, and we will be uh, we are having. Uh, digital savvy companies, company all of a sudden becoming digitally savvy and uh, and also virtual reality. For example, this panel discussion is being organized virtually rather than uh, in the form of a physical meeting or a physical. Uh, this this has become a pattern, uh, become a, a new trend around the world. Even after the COVID epidemic, maybe this may be having a having a new practice because people have enjoyed its advantages and the work from home revolution and uh, that is having a major impact uh, when we look into the details it has tremendous impact on various sectors of the economy uh, various sectors I, and uh, when we look into the into the uh, the vehicle demands it will have a, this work from home uh, revolution will be having a major impact on demand for new vehicles as well as use of existing vehicles. And uh, now uh, nations and leaders have realized that 
the real wealth of the country is not gdp it is a, it is a real wealth of a country is the health the health infrastructure what is the health facilities and health infrastructure of the country is more important and that was the most important lesson uh, taught by this covid epidemic so we'll go to we'll now we can go to uh, the maybe we can go to the slide number 16 slide last slide Slide number 16. I am skipping a number of slides because more explanation on yeah. the whole information here. Yeah. Because I have to, yeah, more last slide that is factors determining prospects of rubber industry in future. So we have seen uh, short term issues and long term issues because of the uh, because of the reshaping of the business world. Now, the prevailing crisis in the rubber industry is not specific to the sector, rubber sector. The crisis in the rubber sector industry is only a manifestation of the crisis in the whole economy. So this is not a crisis in the rubber industry. In their economy is having a crisis that is manifested in the rubber industry. That means the short and long term approach called for wider perspective that uh, rather than focusing on rubber sector alone. Rubber sector has implication on that. So that should be separately treated, dealt with, that is important. So broadly speaking, five points I want to highlight. Uh, so uh, the, when we look into the post-COVID strategies, five points I would like to highlight. Effectiveness of governments in designing and speedy implementing strong strong i want to underscore strong stimulus measures to revive the economy and the business this is number one this is should be done uh, very this is should be done at the earliest and depending on how each country's how how, how strong is each country's measures uh, the return will be depending on that second one effectiveness of each segment of rubber industry each segments mean it could be manufacturing sector it could be processing sector it should be trade or it could be production sector effectiveness of each segment of rubber industry in taking advantage of the increasing role of states we have seen the state is having a more increasing role and also increasing protectionism and increasing localization how is segment of the rubber industry is it going to take advantage of this change third one ability of companies or firms in using the crisis as an opportunity to modernize business activity to make it fit for the future with the more focus with the focus on greener economy and the fourth one preparedness to manage the challenge facing the vehicle industry so the vehicle industry may have serious challenges in future basically uh, uh, due to the work from home and a number of other uh, emerging changes. So how well countries are going to manage or work industry leaders are going to manage the crisis. And also we have tremendous opportunities available from the health sector because how well countries are going to exploit the opportunities for rubber and the rubber products arising from the huge investments anticipated in the healthcare sector. So next uh, few years will be having a major change in the health sector. Uh, huge investment uh, because country rest that the country's health wealth is uh, is the investment in the health sector so that will be happening so how each country is going to exploit that opportunity these are the major points i would like to highlight the remaining points i can add during the discussion but thank you chairman thank you thank you uh, thank you very much mr john jackson it's quite clear from the presentation that we are in for a very tough time for rubber industry and the uh, global economy is going through a tough time and this is impacting the demand as shown by uh, Mr. John Jacob. We have to work on the demand side of the equation. Uh, but the problem is how to, how do we work on that demand? So maybe I can ask uh, Mr. John Jacob first. Uh, in terms of building on this demand for rubber, how can countries do it? Or how can rubber producing countries come up with a policy to push for this demand? Yes. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. In fact, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the old people uh, hearing from different countries, in fact, demand, uh, uh, at least countries have taken various measures to generate the demand for natural rubber in the past few years in response to the lower rubber prices and the poor demand. Uh, in fact, such measures were uh, yes, 
uh, focused on some of the uh, non-conventional applications, promoting some of the non-conventional applications such as rubberization of roads. When we look into the total quantity of natural rubber absorbed in such activities, the total quantity of, of natural rubber absorbed in such activities taken as a percentage of the world consumption, it is not substantial. It is not having a, not going to have a major uh, impact on the uh, rubber price in a major, not major impact, it, but it has short term positive impact because such kind of initiative for the government create positive sentiment in the market. And also the people in the sector will have that the government is ready to help us. So such kind of, some kind of a, a caring feeling they'll be getting and also some kind of a demand it generates, but the, uh, the it's, the quantum is not substantial. But how rubber demand is rated? 70% or 75% of the rubber demand comes from the automobile industry. So at the moment, automobile industry is doing, uh, performing very bad. And uh, if we go further deep, in the demand for rubber in the automobile industry, uh, we split by, right? Mainly it is coming from the tire. Tire has two segments. One is an original equipment, that is a demand for tire, mm -hmm for the new vehicles and also we have the replacement demand which is uh, the retail market that is actually when we replace a tire that is a major component around 75 or 80 percent of the tire demand is coming from the replacement demand and not from the original equipment demand so much yeah. demand okay. comes yeah right thank you very much John. yeah yeah the other thing is uh, we know what goes down will come up and I would like to ask uh, Dr. John Baffers, see, over the period of the pandemic, most economies have lowered their interest rate and they have imposed moratoriums on loans and repayment. This is to spur spending. But the question is the fear factor, because there is fear of a depression coming. So with this problem of liquidity in the market, do you think that there will be enough uptake to push the demand? Uh, thanks, Dr. Ahmed. That's a very good question. And indeed, as uh, I said earlier, and my, my uh, colleagues uh, mentioned, I mean, most uh, governments have pushed uh, uh, interest rates down to almost uh, zero or even negative territory. The central banks have uh, engaged in uh, various forms of uh, purchasing assets. And a lot of governors, of course, have engaged in various fiscal measures, as you said, uh, uh, to, uh, to impose moratoriums in the loan repayments and uh, uh, push spending. And uh, so in that respect, uh, we believe that the governments, most especially by major economies, took the right measures to, uh, to sort of kickstart the uh, demand. Uh, now, uh, whether we're going to... Uh, uh, sort of a more severe uh, economic slowdown, I don't think at this stage depends as much uh, on the governments as it depends, uh, simply because they did their best, I would say, it depends a lot of uh, whether, A, we have a second wave of the pandemic because things are getting better as we see now during the summer season of the Northern Hem Hemisphere. Things are getting better and the, the restrictions that the lockdowns are relaxed, they are gradually relaxed. So the question is, are we going to see a second wave of the pandemic? So that's the, the biggest short-term issue, the short-term risk. And the longer-term risk is as to whether we're going to have a, either an effective treatment, treatment of the pandemic or we're going to have a vaccine. And we do have reports that uh, at the end of this, this year or early next year, we'll have some positive signs that uh, a vaccine may be within, uh, within reach. In other words, right now, the ball is in the sense of the science side, uh, especially in the vaccine side. And the question is, are we going to have a, a a V-shaped recovery, which is the kind of recovery that uh, I talked and Dar, my good friend Dar, talked about earlier, that uh, we see the worst now, which is the minus 5.2, and then we're going to see something of a recovery of uh, the order of 4% next year. Or uh, if we do not have, uh, if we have a second wave of pandemic or we do not have any vaccine or treatment or whatever, we see this slowdown uh, continues the next year and the year after. So the short answer to your question, I don't think it's 
as much the job of the governments uh, as it is the job of the scientists, so to speak, to get us out of this uh, bad situation. And it's uh, what the job oh. in the economists have, whether it's a, a V-shaped recovery versus a, a, a W-shaped recovery or even a L shape, which means we're in the low side of things for quite some time. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. John, for that analysis. So based on all these analyses, uh, gloomy pictures of the situation, uh, can I ask Mr. Dar Wong? Yes, is it sir. Time to divest from the rubber related uh, business or is it a good time to invest? Mm. <laughs> That's a very good question. In fact, I think if you look across the market, a lot of the industries have started to divest, okay, which is a must. Because see, so long as you're doing your existing business and you're not seeing performance, you're not seeing revenue, and the demand has slowed down, I think anybody should start to plan a divestment. Same as rubber industries, all right, depending your upstream, midstream, and downstream. But then to just make it very general, I would like to put it this way. When you're talking about divest, divestment or new investment that depends a lot on you are planning for the short term mid term or the long term whether it's one year or up to three years or beyond three years where we call long term so of course if you are talking about short term if you want to survive and still keep your plantation for the upstream player i think um uh, it is worth considering perhaps uh, to do some cross cultivation of crops as we know there are a lot of crops out there that can um harvest within one year they are like yam pineapple uh, cassava onions these are all the all the crops that can help the farmers to stay in place with some revenue and if you are talking about midterm all right uh, midterm anywhere to survive within one or two more years because the market is really tough i think a lot of company midstream especially they should be focusing a lot more on r d because today when we talk about rubber most of the people just uh, remember auto industries and making tires. But the fact is that car sales or car demand has dropped down so tremendously. If I remember the figure correctly, in in uh, UK alone, in the month of April, the new car sales registration was down by 76%, if I remember correctly. And that's the worst figure since 1948. You see, so a lot of countries are having this same problem. So when, when we talk about mid-term divestment, there are a lot of more things that rubber can manufacture into, but you need a lot of R&D. And I think it's worth looking at that. For example, i give a, a few examples. Like what can rubber make into? Mattresses, cushions, raincoats, boots, pillows, water bottles, you know, cable, cable tubings, rubber mat, or even rubber bitumen on bigger, industry, uh, bigger industrial um, uh, usage. So there are a lot of recycled products that can be used by putting rubber materials when you put in a good use. So I, I believe R&D is a need. So if you're looking at a midterm, I think a lot of companies should start to divest that, spend some money instead of sitting down there and do nothing and get hit by the economic uh, slowdown or stand still. Okay, so on the long term, okay, I'm talking about on the long term transformation, I would still uh, stand very firmly that it is good, okay, for this year or even next year to start uh, buying more asset like rubber plantations or rubber factories? Because the answer is very, the, the reason is very simple. Like I, I remember Dr. John mentioned in the first session that uh, the uh, dollar is probably going to be devalued in the long term. And no matter how you look at it, we, we will not deny that the demand for commodity prices will be slow for this year next year. But on the midterm onwards to long term, okay, perhaps beyond two years, dollar will start to devalue. That is for sure because of... Uh, oversupply of dollar in the market, you know, uh, too much new printed dollars, you know, and a lot of such, um, like, a lot of such factors like uh, interest rates are dropping for the Fed funds. So indirectly, or on the inverse side, we are looking at commodity prices to have a very fast, rapid recovery, perhaps two years later. Of course, I put a disclaimer. And that's where rubber prices will come back. But a lot of people will wait until rubber prices come back, as I mentioned in my session earlier, beyond $1.40 per kg, people will, start, people will start to rush, chase, buy things that are expensive, buy assets, buy plantation, build factories. I think even though you have money, but you're going to spend a lot more money at that time. So why don't you just, you know, bite the bullet, do more research, start to long assets this year or next year. But that is provided on a long-term basis. So I cover on a short term, 
a mid term and a long term. Thank you, Prof. Okay, very good. Yes, Thank you. I think rubber is going to be still in demand for the world. Mm. Mm. And the long term is the way that we should go, I think. Yes, and for sure. Like, okay, buy when it is low and not buy when it's gone up. Right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> We do have one uh, a question Prof, from the audience. If I may, uh, another reminder to all our viewers out there, if you have any more inquiries or questions, kindly share them on Slido, hashtag rubber expert inside at live, or do tweet us at GRC Secretary. Back to you, Professor. Yeah, uh, there is one question for uh, John Jacob. There is a question, he said, what do you mean by the state is back? You? Oh, yeah, listen to me. State is back, actually. Yeah. Uh, it's actually the active intervention of the state has assumed the more importance. COVID-19 has seen that active role of the state is very important in managing a crisis. When there's a crisis, state should be there. So when there's a crisis, people will ask for the state and state is there. So in countries where state performed well, came back very fast and in countries where state could not perform well the the return was slow so this is a way this is what i meant thank you sir right so you did also say that the is a return of protectionism which is also emerging as another challenge for the global economy uh dr john can you comment on this Yes, uh, in fact, protection uh, is not something uh, that uh, came up uh, within the COVID-19 context. We had seen a lot of uh, uh, trade frictions, especially between the United States and China. That was uh, two years ago when we had the steel tariffs, when we had the uh, uh, tariffs in other various uh, commodities. We had the tariffs from the, the other side, from the China side, on the soybean and soybean products. So it was something that uh, had already started uh, back two to three years ago. Uh, now, uh, what I would say, yes, we do have, uh, the, there are some issues or questions as to whether protection is going to accelerate within the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but uh, uh, my, my personal view on this is that uh, I see that the danger is not as much uh, sort of government driven that the governments are going to impose protections. I think it's probably going to come from the private sector that uh, because of the fear uh, due to the pandemic, as well as the trade frictions, the private sector is going to take a second look at how exposed are the supply chains throughout the various countries. And I think that supply chains are going to take, a, the, the, the companies are going to take a second look at the supply chains. And so they are going to reduce sort of the interaction that we had across borders. And they are going to probably, as we say, reshore, bring back home some of the activities that now they are dispersed around the world. So I see more of a private sector response to both the trade issues that we had experienced one or two years ago, and in addition to the COVID-19 pandemic that we experience now, is that the private sector is going to respond. It's going to kind of shrink the exposure to have that it has in various countries. So I think supply chain is the big uh, item, ticket item to watch as we go forward. Yes, I think supply chain is a very critical thing that has been impacted badly in this uh, pandemic. Precise. I would like, there is a question from one of the uh, participants. As you know, in the whole situation of low rubber price, the sector most impacted are the farmers. They are the one most impacted. So now there is a question from uh, uh, the participant. He said, why don't we introduce this user pay tax on products based on NR-based products and channel this tax to help the farmers continue growing rubber? Mr. Darwong, maybe you want to respond to that? Mm. Idea? I will just give a short response because I would think, honestly, uh, John is in a better place to answer this because of his uh, role and <laughs> uh, and, and our a, a and RPC. Okay, um, 
But I will briefly comment on this. Yes, it is a, a good idea, all right, uh, a way to also promote to the retail markets or among all the uh, generic users of uh, supporting and buying rubber products by, by, by identifying such a label, all right? So I think it is good. But many times uh, I would want to put it um, in, in my way. Uh, I always believe for such a policy or anything, that need to be supported or need to be communalized in the market, the government has to do a fair bit of work to push uh, the practice or the new policy into the market to get people. This is this is the purpose is to raise the exposure and to educate um, the common retailers or family holders that you know it's always green products or it is always protecting the earth or it is always good to support the farmers. Okay, for selecting rubber-based product instead of buying synthetic or or chemical-based product, because by simply um the by simply depending on perhaps like ANRPC or maybe some associations or society, it's going to be a tough job, and it will also spend some money to do such an exercise. So um I I do believe and truly feel that the government must play a part in this in order to help the farmers because uh. Although I'm not a farmer, I'm a financial guy, but I, I, did visit, I, I did a lot of visit to plantations and to farmers in many countries when I joined GRC and also with Dr. Aziz. Uh, I do feel that farmers work hard, so they should be rewarded in some ways. Government must play a part in this. And that is what yeah, I, think uh, I want to say. Yeah. Here, the rationale mm. given by the participant is that mm. uh, rubber has got this environmental benefit. And you grow yes it. definitely reward yes. the farmer in fact yes in fact rubber rubber i did a research before rubber is a very environmental friendly tree you know that actually uh, will also contribute to the um, to reduce the carbon footage but it's just that nobody has really done anything okay on this part they only know that pine trees are good you know it protect the earth and uh, like palm oil trees are detrimental to earth but Nobody really has spent a lot of time studying rubber. And I did a little bit of research before. And I hope that um, somebody can take up the job and continue to do research and, and educate the world how rubber trees can actually help to protect the earth and the soil. John? Yeah. John? Perhaps you, you can comment. To... Yep. Yeah, this, is, this topic has been discussed for a long time. Uh, in fact, actually, <laughs> we have a working group also, NRP is a working group also, uh, mm. promoting the green credentials of natural rubber. And uh, mm. the NRPC, together with the International Rubber Research and Development Board, made some initiative uh, to capitalize on the green credentials of natural rubber. And uh, this mm. work is going on, but there are so many, uh, what's called the stumbling blocks in the process. So it's a long topic. It's a, it takes a long time to discuss the whole story. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah. <laughs> this is a very challenging topic to get, but I mm. hope the NRPC will actually be stronger in fighting for this. No? <laughs> yeah, in fact, actually, we have represented the <laughs> issue in the United Nations Climate Change uh, Convention. Uh, but there are so many, uh, uh, some of the norms, existing norms and some of the definitions are actually uh, some, of the, uh, some of the barriers in uh, getting things done in the, in the way we expect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We realize this. In fact, yeah. uh, <clears throat> for many years already, people have been talking about the green yeah. contribution of natural rubber, but mm. to actually get to be appreciated and recognized within the economy, within the global industry is a challenge. Anyway, I think we have uh, more or less come to the end of our uh, panel discussion. Uh, what I want to say is that the, the pandemic has actually impacted badly on the rubber, except of course, gloves. So that's why they say during the pandemic, you invest in two Gs. One is glove, the other one is gold. So glove, uh, Malaysia, <laughs> Malaysia, we have uh, actually benefited from this uh, pandemic in the glove uh, area. And, uh, but there are still a lot of uh, issues and challenges that we need to work on. Uh, in Malaysia, we are part of a team in the Academy of Science. We are now preparing a position paper 
on natural rubber and recommend uh, steps to actually bring the industry to a higher level in terms of contributing to the economy and also helping the entire industry realize the benefit of this uh, rubber. So uh, I think with those uh, concluding words, uh, I'm sure we agree that it has been a very enlightening discussion on the various topics with regard to rubber production, rubber demand, investment in rubber, and impact on prices of rubber. So we hope this kind of deliberation and debate will continue so that at the end of the day, our main objective is to come up with good solutions which can bring win-win situation to those who produce rubber and those who consume rubber. Thank you very much. And Bani, please. Thank you very much once again to all our esteemed guests, Professor Ahmad, Dr. John, Joe, and Dara, for joining all of us today. If you want to hear more in-depth insight from all of them, do catch up with all of them, of course, in person during the upcoming 16th Global Rubber Conference 2020 in Bangkok, Thailand. Thank you once again for watching Expert Insight at Live. If you like what you have seen, do subscribe to Confex Hub channel. And also follow us on our LinkedIn page, FB page, and Twitter for more interesting episodes and topics on market, policy, strategy, technology, and innovation in your economic sector that have steered the industry growth. Coming up next. How blockchain can solve supply chain meltdowns exposed by coronavirus pandemic, June 25th, 2020, 11 a.m.